Presentation skills are like a superpower when it comes to your PhD. Whether or not you're giving a talk at a conference, you're defending your thesis, you're presenting to your peers and your lab or your group, it doesn't matter. It is all about filling them with confidence. The take home thing from this video should be people remember how you make them feel and not the words that you say. And uh, using the techniques that I'm going to tell you in this video, I've actually won tens of thousands of dollars for my startup, for grant funding. Um, and it's amazingly simple once you master a few important tips and skills. Um, and ultimately, it comes down to developing your confidence in your presentation skills. Skills, and we'll go through that in this video. Um, it can be relatively scary getting up and talking about your work, this feeling that, oh no, they're gonna find out that I know nothing about my PhD, or oh no, I'm gonna look stupid. You know, like academia is all about trying your best not to look stupid at any moment. Um, but we'll go through all of the tips and tricks that I've learned along the way, and I'll share them to make you not only a much better speaker, but also a more confident speaker. This video is brought to you by my newsletter. Go check it out at andrewstapleton.com.au forward slash newsletter. I'll put a link in the description and there you can get all of the insider content that I don't publish anywhere else. And uh, in the future, you'll be the first to find out about all of my projects, all of the new content, um, and you won't miss a thing. Go sign up. The first skill that you really need to master when it comes to presenting anything related to your PhD or just presentations in general is being able to work out who your audience is and the exact sort of information that they need at the right level, the right density, the right sort of terminologies that you can use with that audience. Now, before I start doing anything with my PhD research presentations or my startup presentations, or if I'm presenting a progress update to an industry partner like I did during my postdocs, I would always think about who will be in the room. Whether or not it's five people or 200 people, it doesn't really matter. You need to kind of think about, okay, who are they? What do they already know about you? And a lot of the times it's best to assume that they know nothing about your research unless you're presenting to your research group. Um, and what sort of terminologies can I use, but also what sort of presentations do they normally sit through? Like familiarity, I think, with an audience goes a really long way. So there's no point doing this amazing showmanship, privileged, like awesome presentation if you're, if the uh, people in the room are normally used to relatively technical stuff, they just want to get through the information, you know, they don't want any sort of frills around the edges, um, that's sort of a really good way to gauge what type of presentation you should give but also how much information should go in it and uh, the style, I guess, broadly speaking. But no matter what, uh, no matter what the style, whether it's really informational, really technical, there needs to be a story, there needs to be a structure, and importantly, you need to deliver it with confidence. So um, without those sort of elements combined, the audience would always feel a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit lost. But by understanding the demographics of your audience, how they normally um, sort of receive uh, information and, you know, whether or not you need graphs or diagrams or whether or not they just want to hear you speaking, you know, like that is the number one step. Know your audience, know what they want and uh, spend like, you know, 20 minutes just writing down who they are, what they really want from you. You know, sometimes it's as bland as they want me to go in, deliver the data and leave, like a technical um, presentation like I used to do for industry partners. They don't want entertaining, they're not sitting through a whole day's worth of um, of presentations like at a conference. So at a conference, I would normally up the uh, up the entertainment value a little bit, maybe be a little bit more kind of outlandish and um, you know have some funny slides or sp slides that I think are at least funny. Um, and that way you kind of like, you know, re-inject a bit of energy into a room that's been sat down for a long time. So uh, yeah, know your audience, know exactly what they want. And that is the first step. 
After you've kind of looked at your audience, the next thing is work out how to tell the story of what you're saying. Now, people are strange. They do not remember data. They do not remember words necessarily. They remember stories. We all remember stories way better than information. And the real big skill and trick here is to work out a structure for what you are saying that closely matches a um, typical story structure. And it's really simple. Now, I went to South by Southwest a few years ago and I was struck by the simplicity of this structure. It was about um, the A, B, T method. So, and, but, therefore. And what you do, this story structure just essentially forces you into telling a story that our brains like. Now, it can be a little bit more complicated and ins and outs of all the different things, but ultimately, no matter what I'm doing, I always make sure, have I got enough background? So the and statements, where you string together a bit of background with ands so that people understand what you're saying. So um, solar panels and uh, the sun and efficiency and conducting polymers, you know, as long as they kind of got that background and I can kind of string it together with ands, that is enough of a background for me to then talk about my problem statement, the but. So the but of a story is the problem. So the way that our human brains are wired is that we are always trying to protect ourselves and stop us becoming ill or in danger. And so the but statement really has to be the biggest problem that your research is solving or the story um, that you're, you're telling, um, that has to have the biggest problem statement uh, like possible. And so by saying but, you'll definitely be able to kind of put yourself into that problem mode. So with me, um, it was in my, in my uh, research, it was uh, about solar, solar panels and conducting polymers, but the efficiency and the scalability of this technology is bad, which means that we're not utilizing it. So that was really sort of the problem statement, but the more emotional you can make your problem statement, the better. And if you're in the humanities, um, if you're in sort of social sciences, you know, really play on the emotional uh, problems to really sort of hook your audience in. And the last bit of the story structure is the T, the therefore. And that is where you provide a relief and a solution to the problem statement that you've just set up. So remember you've got and, all of the background information, keep it as brief and concise as possible. Then your problem statement in your sort of story structure. So you say, but, and then the problem, and therefore what you've done to solve it. So for my solar panel um, ex uh, example, it was about, therefore we have um, created a solution processable solar panel with a high efficiency, which can be scaled much more easily than the batch processing, blah, blah, blah. And then this is how we did it. So those are the really simple basic steps for telling a story. And uh, if I ever feel myself getting lost and muddled up about my presence, presentation, I go back to those three fundamental steps and I make sure that I, I cover them in that order and that the story flows on from it. And the most important thing about all this is all of the words, all of the things that you're going to say, people will not remember it, like even like two hours later, I guarantee you. But what they do remember is how you made them feel. So if you make them feel like there's a big problem and you have solved it, that is going so uh, far in terms of making people remember what you say. And so the structure is very important, but remember that people don't remember what you say, they remember how you made them feel. So at all of these points during the story, you're like, hmm, how can I make people feel a certain way? And by injecting that question into my kind of process of creating a presentation, I've been able to really sort of increase the impactfulness of what I'm saying. Once you've got that story structure, the ABT structure, one thing I highly recommend then is you look at the energy of your talk. Now, a lot of people, when they first get up, they kind of go, hi, my name's Thun, and they repeat the slide. But really, you want to get out there and you want to capture their attention immediately. And the, the kind of more important bit where you want people to really be engaged is the end. And so the way I look at it is that you've got this kind of like valley. So you've got the beginning. Hang on, how would you look at this? Beginning, 
like this, and then a dip in energy where you provide the information and you know you just talk about the technical aspects, and then you want your conclusion to be high energy, so an emotional, impactful statement. And I quite often use a headline analyzer online to have a look to see how emotion, my how emotive my opening statement is and my end statement is, and that's really important because you want to leave people with that feeling like, oh yeah, this is great. You know, they won't remember what you say remember, but by the by making them feel a certain way, you can get them to remember your talk more than anyone else's, and they may even remember some of the details if you're lucky. Um, but yes, high emotional quality, energetic statements, which really sort of capture people's attention at the beginning and the end. So the way I write my presentations is I start with the end, and I go, where do I want to go? What's the most impactful statement that I want to say right at the very end of my talk, how do I make sure that the beginning kind of like foreshadows that a little bit? And then in the middle bit, I spend less time. You know, that's where the graphs go, that's where the figures go, um, and it's really kind of a, a journey like this. So strong beginning, stronger end, some information in the middle, and there's kind of a way to make the middle bit more interesting, and that's by just repeating stuff. Like, people don't realize the power of just repetition while you're giving a presentation. Like if you show a graph, highlight specifically what you want them to get from it, how it rates, uh, relates to your conclusions. So just repeat the main sort of take home message time and time and time again throughout the entire presentation. And then with the high energy, the emotion and that repetition, people will start to kind of not only feel what you've said, but also start to remember, oh, it's the person that, you know, said, and then, you know, the, the maybe five word phrase that you want people to take home uh, throughout, your, um, throughout your presentation. Now we all get very nervous when we are told we're gonna to have to give a presentation. Even me, I have given hundreds of presentations to rooms up to 200, 300 people, and I always get scared. There's no doubt about it. But what I've done is I've learned to turn the nerves into excitement. And that's just kind of by brainwashing myself a little bit, I think, is that I like to think of the nerves as the fuel which is gonna keep me alert and excited and bigger and more energetic. Um, and that therefore bleeds over into the presentation. And I know exactly what it's like, even as a, as a relatively confident speaker, uh, just before like going up to talk, I feel so rubbish and like just anxious and like I, I want to run away and my heart rate goes up and my, my heart pounds and I just cannot kind of like get all of the things out of my mind such as I'm going to forget this, um, people are going to laugh at me, I'm going to look stupid. But as soon as I step on stage and I say that first opening line that I've practiced a lot and a lot, it kind of just goes and goes and goes and it's about reframing the nervous energy into excitement um, and that has been a huge game changer for me. So I feel the things, I allow myself to feel the adrenaline, but I reframe it in the fact that, well, this is gonna help me perform my best when I'm in front of hundreds of people or even five people that I was, you know, when I was doing my uh, industry reports. So that is very important. Reframing nervous into excitement is very uh, powerful. Okay, I could do a whole video on how to structure a presentation, uh, the number of slides, what to say, how to lay it out, the design features, but one thing I think really holds true no matter what you're doing, whether you're using PowerPoint, Prezi, whether or not you're just going up and you know sticking up one slide and talking, um, these things should always support what you're saying and not tell the story. So this is something I see go wrong time and time again, is that people use PowerPoint or Prezi, you know, to actually tell the story instead of supporting what they're saying. Now, I get around this by using um, high quality images that I get from unsplash.com, which is Creative Commons open uh, free use images, high quality images, and I put that on a slide, and then I put maybe one graph, one table, or I put, uh, you know, just like a simple saying or maximum three bullet points. And so by 
allowing that to kind of help me remember what I need to say. I'm using it to support what I'm saying rather than it telling the story on its own. If you can go through a presentation without the speaker and, and really understand what they're trying to say, the nuances of what they're trying to say, um, it's too much, there's too much information. So use it to support what you're saying rather than to tell the story altogether. And uh, there is like a little rule and a myth where people say, oh, well, you should aim for one slide per minute. And I find that that's probably too much for most people, you know, flicking through slides. And, and the difference here actually, it's one slide per minute and more if you're presenting online. An online presentation, you do need more slides to keep people busy, otherwise they're just looking at you on a screen. But in an in-person presentation, you should you know, aim for less. The, the fewer number of slides and the more people are focused on you, the better. And so uh, learning your script, you know, like loosely your script, and I use the the uh, multimedia that I'm showing people to kind of prompt me. So if I get a little bit lost, I move forward in the slides and I look up and go, oh, it's that graph. And I go, well, as you can see, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so those are really the most important things about giving a presentation. If you're being supported by multimedia, whether it be video, whether it be photos, graphs, tables, all of that stuff. And also one of the biggest things is if you are showing tables and graphs, do not just copy and paste from where you have published them before. A graph that is, is published in a journal or in um, a thesis is not good enough to go on your uh, slides. You need to redesign that so it's obvious to the audience, like without a shadow of doubt what line you are talking about. Increase the axis titles, sizes, increase the contrast, you know, remove some of the extra data that you're just not talking about. So highlight things in a table, highlight the row that you're talking about, really gray out the other bits if they're not important. Like that is kind of the, the tip of, um, and, and the, the number one way of making people not just give up. If you show a lot of data or a lot of stuff on a slide, people look at it and if they can't get it instantly, they start to turn off a little bit. There's only a few people that will go, okay, I've got like you know a minute before they change the slide, what's going on? And they're trying to listen and decide and decipher and come up with their own sort of conclusions based on what you're showing them, boom, and then you move on. So it needs to be absolutely obvious. And the, uh, the rule for all of this is make sure that the multimedia supports what you say rather than telling the story on its own. So there we have it. There are all of the insider secrets, the PhD tips and tricks for giving your presentation. Let me know in the comments what you would add and I shall see you in the next video.